America, the land of plenty. Where Dr. Christian's been learning the truth about the country's obesity crisis in Evansville, its fattest city. We've had large caskets for as young as 11 years old. I'm really distressed. He wants to stop us Brits from following suit. I found the whole thing really quite eye-opening in the amount of people involved, the cost of the equipment involved, how the NHS is ever going to cope with that, I have no idea. And swapping diets tonight, it's super-sized Saskia versus super-skinny Nick. I'm like three of you. <laughs> They'll be entering the feeding clinic to shock them into ditching their disastrous diets. Do you not think you should at least try to eat the porridge? I am eating what you normally eat. And changing their ways. I'm letting you down and I'm letting myself down, but I just can't eat the food. Plus, we're exploring the desperate world of life-threatening eating disorders. In one period of about nine months, I lost just over 11 stone. After all, it's not what you're eating, it's what's eating you. getting bigger. By 2030, it's predicted a fat 40% of us will be obese. But across the pond, Evansville, Indiana, is almost there. Do you think this problem's getting worse? Yes. The patients are sicker because of the obesity. They require more frequent hospitalizations. Over the past six weeks, Dr. Christian's witnessed the devastating impact obesity has had on the city and heard that some residents are reluctant to change. I don't want to do any of it, sorry. Health isn't important. No, it is. I just want nothing to do with it. But not here. According to the Gallup poll, which named Evansville as America's fattest city, 37.8% of the population are obese. With a fast food joint on every corner, it's easy to see why. A study reports that in the US, portion sizes offered by fast food chains are two to five times larger than when first introduced, and the average American spends $500 or 313 pounds a year on fast food. Scarily, us Brits spend more, shelling out 365 pounds each on junk food. Why do people eat out so much? I think convenience. You get off work, you know, nobody wants to cook. It's a lot easier when you have more restaurants per capita than any other city. I'm sort of investigating why Evansville has got this accolade of America's fattest city. What, what's going on there? What are your thoughts? <laughs> well, that's a good point. I, I would say that probably people just uh, eat too much. Being is really portion is everything's yeah, too big. Portions, yeah, portions, uh, yeah. And, you know, you've got to use some control sometimes. Dr. Christian wants to find out for himself what the people of Evansville find so hard to resist. So what's kind of the most popular dish here? What do people really choose most? Uh, our pulled pork and our barbecued ribs. Can I try some? You sure can. Whoa, OK. They are the biggest, baddest baby backs in the business. You've said it. <laughs> in a rack of ribs this size with coleslaw on the side, you're looking at a massive 2,300 calories. Although I don't really want to admit it, this is really good, but it is far too much for one person. The number of calories in this is phenomenal. And if you're eating this sort of thing regularly, then this is definitely going to make you pile on the weight. And with so many places serving up the same kind of fat-laden feasts, there's a lot to tempt the people of Evansville. So where do they seek redemption? Evansville falls within America's Bible Belt, and has even more churches than it does restaurants. So the parishioners of Bethel Temple have decided to call on God's help to win the city's battle against the bulge by mixing fitness with faith. Thank you, Lord. We pray that you will give strength and energy as the people in this room are working on body, mind, and spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, so we've got God in our souls, our spirits, is everybody ready to work out? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Come on! Energy! Yeah. Get your own legs here! Woo! Lift your hands! Well, here you go. I have 
seen it all now. Jesus and weight loss. Why not? We're doing joy jumps. We're doing power praises, uh, prayer arms like this. You're looking up to God. We feel that God can empower you to do maybe more than what you would have been able to do otherwise. What do you get out of this? Um, helping me lose weight. Why the sort of the gospel and the weight loss? How do they work together? Because God's there helping you get through it. I like the fellowship. I want to be healthier. And they don't judge you for being overweight. And they encourage you. And they're with you every step of the way. I have to admit, not being a religious man, I was a little bit skeptical about this. But you know what? This was a good, high-energy, keep-fit class. And if you live in a country where you eat the sorts of foods that they have here, you need to be doing this regularly. And this is just what these guys are doing. It's perfect. Back in the UK, Dr Christian's waging a war against weight on both ends of the scale. He's gathered all eight super sizers and eight super skinnies under one roof. They're getting some shock treatment by facing their opposites before they go into the feeding clinic to tackle their own bad habits. And tonight, Dr. Christian's chosen... Saskia, I'm going to pair you up with Nick. <laughs> Hi, Saskia. Hi, I'm like three of you. <laughs> I would like to lose about three stone. I want three stone, so I'll trade you. <laughs> yeah, that'll be great. Saskia's diet is dripping in fat, whereas food scientist Nick won't eat anything unless he's analysed the fat content first. I think I'm going to have my work cut out for me teaching these two about food. Saskia Roberts from South London is only 23 years old, but already her weight matches her age, and that's down to a love of one thing. My favourite type of food is Caribbean food. I like jerk chicken, curry goat, rice and peas, um, patties, macaroni and cheese, fried chicken. I like Caribbean food a lot. Caribbean food has a lot of flavours, a lot of seasoning. It's delicious. So delicious, in fact, that one serving is never enough. At lunchtime, I'll probably go back for second. At dinner time, I'll probably go back for second. If there's some left, I'm always tempted to go back and have more. I don't know when I'm full. I think I do eat three times what an average person would eat. But eating for three is having an effect on mum of one, Saskia. Thank you, Mommy. My weight's stopping me from doing a lot of things. I'm just not fit enough to be running around after a two-year-old in the park. I don't like the way I look when I'm chasing him around as well. Oh, very relaxing. I kind of feel people look at me and judge me and then they kind of think, you know, how well are you looking after your son at the weight you are? But Saskia's not only being judged by strangers. I don't like the way I look. My arms, my legs, my bum, my chest, everything. I don't like my body at all. I have moments where I just sit down and cry and I think about all the things I want to change and it seems like such a big thing. And there's more than just vanity driving her desire to change. My family have a history of high blood pressure and diabetes and it's like I feel like I'm just a sitting duck waiting for it to happen. I'm 23 and I don't want to die of weight-related issues. I need to do something about it now. At the other end of the scale, 25-year-old Nick Harvey from Cardiff weighs in at just 7 stone 12 pounds. As a food analyst, Nick knows exactly what goes into our grub, but it seems that sometimes too much knowledge can be a bad thing. I'm really fussy about the foods that I eat. I read the labels on foods virtually every time I pick something up. The fat content, the salt content, I'm quite geeky about that sort of thing. So it's got quite a lot of sugar in this one. Quite a lot of salt has been about. And Nick is just as methodical when he sits down to eat. Never really mixed the food that I'm eating. I like to eat them one section at a time. It starts with my favourite. I'll eat the chicken, carrots, sweet corn, potatoes, broccoli. 
Nobody likes broccoli. Your food looks like you're experimenting on it. You don't cut your food up, you dissect it. Everything I do at work is broken down into little bits. For science boffin Nick, it's not just how he eats, but when too. My work's regimented by timings. I know what I'm going to eat and I know when I'm going to eat it. I have my porridge every day at 10.40 a.m. Lunch is always at 1 o'clock. 2.45, there's always a break. And I usually snack on an orange. My vice is oranges. I eat a lot of oranges. But Nick's super low-fat diet and picky eating have taken their toll on his body. I see, like, my knobbly knees, like, my elbows, the parts of my ribs and stuff. I've always wanted to be bigger than I am rather than a skinny, twigglety boy. I control the food that I'm working with at work. I'd rather it not be able to control me. 15 stone, 9 pounds between them, both Nick and Saskia are in diet disaster zones. But before they enter the feeding clinic to tackle their relationships with food, Dr Christian wants to give supersize Saskia a supersize wake-up call. He's sending her to Martinez, California, for a petrifying glimpse into her future if she doesn't change her ways. As she meets 30 stone Lisa Bocchus. Hi, I'm Lisa. Hi, I'm Saskia. Nice to meet you. Yeah, Come nice on in. You. This is my home. When Lisa opened the door, I thought this could be me. <laughs> that was what I was thinking. This could be me very soon. So um, I'm 31, and I do uh, homeowners association management. Willie really pays be the kind bills. Of busy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I pretty much work around the clock. Definitely doesn't leave much time for uh, healthy eating and good habits. <laughs> It's not easy at all sometimes. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> Every day I think about how my weight affects me and it's really starting to wear on my body. My health issues with my weight um, range from high blood pressure to a hiatal hernia to prediabetes. It's very hard to keep my body clean because of all the rolls. My breasts, they're massive. They stick to my belly and uh, they sweat and they cause an odor. I usually get boils underneath my arms or in between my legs. Uh, it, it hurts bad. So tell me a little more about your son. His name again? Kimani. Kimani, that's beautiful. Yeah. That's him. Oh, he's really. so cute! <laughs> and now Lisa wants to show Saskia her pride and joy. Ooh, nice car. Thanks, I like it. I don't fit in it, but I like it. <laughs> As she takes her out for lunch at her favourite Italian restaurant for a slap-up meal, starting with a plate full of chicken wings and garlicky ranch dressing. I love ranch dressing. It's so bad for you, but it's so good followed by a large ribeye steak sandwich and fries, which for most people would be enough. This is kind of a small portion compared to what I normally <laughs> eat. <laughs> and as the two women bond over food, Lisa's got something important to tell single mum Saskia. I got pregnant about two years ago, and it turns out that I was pregnant with twins, and I was about 32 stone, and I was told by the doctors that I couldn't have the babies because I wasn't healthy enough. So I saw my therapist and she was really supportive of, you know, terminating the babies just because of the health thing, but something I struggle with every day. It's a tough, tough experience to go through. But I really just try to block it out. I think I was quite surprised when Lisa told me about her having to have the abortion with the twins. It really scared me that she had to go through that whole like, ordeal, basically, because of her weight. It's day two in Martinez, and after last night's bombshell, Saskia and Lisa are determined to start the day in a healthy way. Oh, my God, this is scary. I feel like I'm going to fall off of it. But the good intentions don't last long as Lisa rustles up calorie-laden pre-packed breakfast muffins. What is it, mate? Uh, it's sausage, egg and biscuit. And as they tuck in, 
Little do they know that Dr Christian's also stateside, keeping his eye on them. Saskia, she's sort of eating for two, essentially. There's always two servings of everything. Lisa confesses she loves her convenience food and, like Saskia, she eats double portions whenever she eats. Saskia, can you get that for me, please? Hello. Hi. Surprise. Very. I thought I'd come and hijack your party. Yeah. <laughs> How's it been going? Yeah, it's really good. Lisa's really taken me out and shown me around. We even actually got on the treadmill for a couple minutes. Yeah. Oh, wow. A couple of minutes. <laughs> Small steps at first, right? <laughs> Small steps. <laughs> Gotta start somewhere, but I was showing her that I have so much things that I can do to help become more healthier, and I'm just not doing it because of so many reasons. Dr. Christian wants to find out why Lisa's finding it so difficult to follow through with her good intentions. So I wanted to show you the bikes that me and my boyfriend have that we always say we're going to take out, we never take out. They and have got nice clean wheels, haven't they? Let's face <laughs> they it. Do. <laughs> you know, my mind's halfway there, my body just isn't there. <laughs> So, my fridge, uh, you can see it's stocked with Diet Coke. And a massive jar of mayonnaise. Yeah. And you know the kind of calorie content of mayonnaise. And... I do, and I've tried the olive oil mayonnaise, and it wasn't the same thing. Okay. Potato chips, yeah. Mm. Those aren't really good for you. I use the olive oil to cook with. I don't yeah. use the bad oil. Lisa, you're a bit of a conundrum, because you drink diet soda, mm -hmm. but you eat lots of rubbish. You cook with olive oil, but you cook rubbish things in the olive oil. You're sort of full of contradictions in a way, aren't okay. you? You're going half the way, but not the whole way. You know, I know what I need to do. I'm just not ready. Lisa knows what her problems are. She's clearly frustrated with herself for not quite getting things together, but she still has a very good chance at sorting her weight problem out. Dr Christian hopes that having spent time with Lisa, Saskia now has a clearer understanding of why she needs to lose weight. It's been a real emotional kind of journey the past two days. When Lisa was telling me about the abortion, that shocked me the most out of everything and not being able to have kids. I want to have another child, and the thought of someone telling me that I can't because of my weight, it's a heartbreaker, I think. If you have a little boy now, and you need to be a healthy mum and set an example, you come first in that by getting that right. It's so important, and I want you to think that. So, this is the start of you getting your life in order, getting your health in order. Yeah. And it's going to be a lot easier than you think, I promise you that. So, Lisa, thank you very much. And I'll see you back in London. See you. All right. Bye bye. Right. Bye. I'm doing this for myself more so than anyone else, but it's also for my son because he really is my life and I don't want him to fall into my bad habits. Thank you so much. Take I care. think Saskia can turn herself around really quick. I think she just needs to have a little more drive to exercise and eat a little better, just like I do. Bye. <laughs> Back in the UK, Dr Christian's in the feeding clinic, ready to shock Saskia and Nick into healthy eating by seeing each other faced with their ridiculous portions. But before they swap diets, he wants to discuss their eating habits. At 5 foot 10, Picky Nick weighs just 7 stone 12 pounds and is almost 3 stone under his ideal weight. How do you see food? It's just a necessity, really. It's just something of, I've got to have. I try to pick healthy foods. I don't really like to eat fatty products and stuff like that. I'm just concerned about putting too much junk into me. You're very much what I call fat phobic. You avoid anything with any sort of a fat content. So getting you kind of back in touch with the concept that actually some fats are good and only a proportion of fats, saturated fats, are bad, I think is really important. I need to learn to not look at everything like I do in the lab. At just five foot two, Saskia weighs in at 23 stone seven pounds, which makes her a colossal 13 stone 10 pounds overweight. About a year and a half ago, my mum had a stroke, and for me, that was kind of like a shock. How has that stroke sort of made you think about health and food? I know that the way I am, I'm going to develop all these things that I'm predispositioned to get anyway, because, you know, I've got a family history of it, and I really don't want to be 
going down that road, having a stroke, I kind of want to be around for my son. No, I mean, it's not inevitable just because you have a family history of things that you're going to get them. What we do know, though, is you can make it easy to get these yeah. things and you can make it a lot harder. And at the moment, you're making it very easy and very likely. Yeah. But I hope you'll change that and make it much less likely. And without further ado, it's time for Saskia and Nick to swap diets, starting with breakfast. A small bowl of plain porridge for Saskia, and Nick's faced with scrambled eggs and four thick slices of buttered white bread. I have a lot of bread. <laughs> <laughs> but scientist Nick can't help himself from analysing what's in front of him. How many eggs are actually in this? Five. Five? <laughs> The eggs aren't the only ingredient to have been supersized in Saskia's diet. How many sugars are in this? Three. I wasn't expecting the sugar in the coffee. It's so sweet. It just... And Saskia's also struggling with the bland porridge. You can have any more of your porridge? I'm so not a porridge person. <laughs> no, it's wait till breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> the first breakfast was not great for me. I don't like porridge at all. After a challenging breakfast, will they fare better at lunch? On the menu, a double portion of Caribbean goat curry, rice and peas for Nick. I was a little bit disgusted to see that much food. It's just a massive amount for one person. And a chicken salad sandwich and small fruit pot for Saskia. I can't eat raw tomatoes. I feel like throwing them up when I have them. I could eat it if it's a little less oily. Like you can see little globules of oil and fat at the sides. And Nick's not wrong. All the meat that Saskia eats accounts for 40% of her fat intake and almost half of her salt intake. It's made me feel quite bloated and full. My stomach's making noises that it doesn't normally make. Dr Christian wants to show Saskia why eating so much fatty meat is so bad for her. Saskia, I brought you out here to talk about meat. Here is a week's worth. That is really a lot of meat. <laughs> Pretty much every single animal is represented here. One frankfurter, on it goes. Two pieces of fried chicken. We have some curried chicken. We have some pork chow mein. Two portions of spicy wings. Seven pork sausages. Three slices of roast beef. Two portions of curried goat. And then we have two chicken burgers. So, how are we doing so far? Horrible. Horrible. We've still got more. A bacon sandwich. Nine chicken nuggets, on we go. Stewed chicken, jerk chicken, a chicken leg, two drumsticks and a thigh. That is your week's worth of meat that you get through sizzling away on my barbecue there. I don't think I really realised how much I am actually eating. But unfortunately, you tend to eat a lot of processed meat and shop-bought meat. And there are all sorts of additives that are added. Sodium nitrite. Basically, it's a preservative that we add to meat to allow it to sit longer on the shelves. Potassium chloride, flavour enhancer. Okay. The trouble with potassium in excess is it can actually cause fatal heart arrhythmias when the heart beats erratically, so not to be had in overdose. We then have 32 grams of salt that you get through in a week. That's shocking. Salt can, in excess, raise blood pressure, which can lead to things like heart disease and stroke, so it's better to keep your salt levels to a recommended daily amount, which is about four grams a day on average, OK? And then finally, 60 grams worth of saturated fat. This is the fat that raises cholesterol, clogs arteries, causes heart disease and it causes stroke. I don't think I was really aware of how much fat the meat actually produces. I'm a bit lost for words. <laughs> Government guidelines say we shouldn't eat over 70 grams of red or processed meat a day. And Dr Christian wants to show Saskia what could happen to her body if she ignores this advice. Do you know what's going on here? I have no idea. This is a condition called gout. Have you heard of gout? Yeah, yeah, I have. Uric acid, which comes as a breakdown product of purines, which you find in meat. Uric acid levels build up, and when they get to a certain level, they start to crystallise out, and they tend to crystallise out in the joints. This causes a really bad inflammatory reaction in the joint. You get this swelling, it gets hot, it's incredibly painful, and it's also very, very destructive. More common in people who are very overweight, more common in people who have very high levels of meat products in their diets as well. So you are a prime target for this sort of thing. 
How do you avoid this? Well, there's medication that can lower uric acid levels. Other people, if it's clearly from their diet, need to cut down on purine-containing foods, and in your case, that would be cutting down on the meat products. That's really hard to kind of deal with, knowing that by the food I'm eating, I could end up like that. Dinner time in the feeding clinic, and there's yet more meat on the menu. What's that? That's jerk chicken and macaroni and cheese. I don't think I've ever had jerk chicken. It's the first time for everything. Mm -hmm. And Nick served up two small unseasoned chicken thighs and salad. Oh, it's very different from mine. <laughs> it's quite a lot of macaroni and cheese. There's a lot of fat in that. It's just there, and I know it is. Yeah, so yeah. it's just at the back of my mind that it's there. Yeah. But despite his concerns, he presses on, unlike Saskia, who's finding Nick's palate too bland for her liking. For me, it's really difficult to eat chicken that's not seasoned. It doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> you tried the avocado yet? No, I don't like the texture of avocado. I find it really, I don't know. It seems like a day's worth of Nick's simple diet is taking its toll on Saskia. I don't think I'm going to be able to eat much more, Nick. I'm feeling really not great. Not feeling too good? No, not at all. I'm feeling super sick. I think I'm going to have to... Do you mind? Do you... Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know if it was because of the food and how bland it was or the taste or texture, I don't know, but I just felt really sick and queasy and not very nice. Caribbean food queen Saskia Roberts and fussy food analyst Nick Harvey are on day two of their diet swap. Morning, Nick. Morning. You okay? I'm not feeling great, but I'm okay. This morning, Nick's breakfast looks more like dinner, as he'll be tucking into a Saskia special leftover cod, mashed potato, and broccoli. Never had mashed potato for breakfast before. So. <laughs> There's stuff from the night before. Um, I'll have it in the mornings. In the afternoon, if there are any leftovers, I would have maybe a snack on that. Whatever's left over from lunchtime, I'd probably snack on before I have dinner. You're eating that really fast. I think that's the fastest I've ever seen you eat. I am quite hungry this morning. I think I'll eat most of it. Whilst Nick, who usually eats to a strict timetable, tucks into his dinner-style breakfast, Saskia hardly touches her second bowl of bland porridge. So how's the porridge going down this morning? Not great. I'm starting to feel a bit sick again. But could you not just be feeling ill from lack of food? I don't think it's from the lack of food. I think it's from the type of food. Do you not think you should at least try to eat the porridge? Because, I mean, I'm eating your leftovers. I'm a bit confused about Saskia's reactions. I'm not sure whether it's all just because she's ill or whether some of it is just a reaction to what she's eating. If it is just the food, then that's a bit annoying because I'm doing my part. She should kind of do hers. Saskia may well be feeling poorly, but life is full of obstacles, and if she wants to succeed at losing weight, then she needs to push herself at all times. And she doesn't have to wait long for another opportunity to make the effort as she's presented with exactly the same lunch she's picked at previously, a chicken salad sandwich and small fruit pot, whilst Nick's got a mountain of mixed-up pasta, tuna and sweet corn. How are you finding the lunch? Yeah, it's OK. Still trying to get over the whole mixed thing. And do you think this is going to help you? Mm. Yeah, or definitely. has helped you? I've definitely started breaking some of the habits already, so... And you'll be able to start mixing up your foods, cos, I mean, that is really mixed up. And I think a bit of variety wouldn't hurt you. Fussy Nick seems to be making progress, unlike Saskia. How are you dealing with the tomatoes? I'm not dealing with the tomatoes. <laughs> I'd really like you to eat the tomatoes, because they are part of the sandwich that I normally eat. I am eating what you normally eat. Yeah, I know. <clears throat> it seems Nick's plain talking has hit a raw nerve. That's one that's upset you. really hard because I really want to do well for you and I can't I just feel like I'm letting you down and I'm letting myself down but I just can't eat the food 
عارف فيها هو ايه او سي دي It's just all a bit too much, you know, not feeling well. I think it's just a mixture of everything. I am sorry. <laughs> I just feel a bit bad for Nick because, you know, he's really trying and it just made me upset because I just felt like um, um, I was letting him down a bit. Over the course of the series, six people have been sharing their very personal experiences of life with an eating disorder. Commonly thought of as conditions that affect mainly women, they can and do affect men too. In the last 10 years, there's been a 66% rise in male admissions to hospital for eating disorders. And Jonathan McIntyre is one of the men affected. At 19 years old, he suffers from disordered eating. In one specific period of about nine months, I lost just over 11 stone. I would tend to not eat for days on end, two or three days, and then I would purge whatever I ate. By purge, I mean that I would make myself sick after I ate. Disordered eating can include eating masses of the same kind of food, choosing foods of a certain colour or shape, and binging and purging. Only two years ago, Jonathan tipped the scales at just over 20 stone. Tormented by bullies and being told to lose weight, he began to starve himself. I sort of became addicted to losing weight, addicted to the fact that I was and that I could. As time went on, the days I fasted became less and the amount I ate became more, but I was also beginning to binge and purge. And this binge purge habit has consumed Jonathan's life over the past year. A major binge would be like buying one or two things from every aisle in the shop and then sometimes take away things as well, and those can be upwards to like 100 quid. Tend to have the things with the temperatures first, basically the fish and chips, then the ice cream. Anything that needs to be cooked then goes into the oven, and then start on the other things, the savoury things, like the sandwiches, the pastries, and generally it just goes from there. In the process of binging, it can be quite hectic, quite frantic. Just tend to unpack things fast, try to eat things as fast as possible. After I've binged, I tend to feel ridiculously uncomfortable. Like, I feel like my, I'm going to burst. And so then I will just tend to purge. Yet the compulsion of disordered eating drives Jonathan to continue. There's three triggers to when I binge. There's a boredom, hunger and stress. I'm quite obsessed and I can't get it off my mind to the point sometimes I get headaches so I just can't stop thinking about it. Sometimes you'll see him and he'll be a lot skinnier than when, what he was last time. It does get you worried about him. But having suffered with chest pains and palpitations, Jonathan's now trying to break the destructive cycle of his disorder. I've had counselling with the community mental health team. It helps for me to talk about it and to get it off my mind and to sort of unwind. I tend not to, to binge and purge as much lately. It tends to only be about maybe in between three and five times a week now, compared to about that much a day. So I'm staying well and staying healthy, trying to focus more on living rather than focusing and obsessing on food as much. Recovering from an eating disorder can be a lengthy process. It's a tough path and sufferers often have episodes of relapse as part of the journey, but it can eventually happen. A year on or two from now, it'd be nice just to be stress-free and to not have to worry about what I'm eating and to have a structure to my life. Back in the feeding clinic, Dr Christian wants Saskia and Nick to take a walk down memory lane. Oh, wow, you look so cute. <laughs> a cheeky grin. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> to see if they can pinpoint where their weight issues began. I think I'm about 16, maybe, in this one. I don't think you look very thin in that. <laughs> you look normal uh, I think it's just kind of a, a normal child. My biggest weight loss would have been when I went to university and I got complete control of my diet that I started fixating on what I was eating. I think that's where my problem started. This is me when I was about four. I was actually quite underweight and they gave me some medications to make me start eating more because I wasn't eating at all. 
and it just went up and up and up. How was school for you? Were you bullied because of your size or anything? Yeah, I mean, in primary school, I was bullied um, quite a bit. I used to hate school. School was like my enemy. It's really quite eye-opening to see all these pitch on the table, isn't it? Yeah, it gives a really clear view of how you've grown and what's happened. Now that they've got a better understanding of where their issues with food began, how will dinner go down? It's chicken all round. Saskia's serving up double helpings of spicy casserole and rice, and at last Nick's treating her to some flavour in the form of a small portion of korma and rice. Do you think you're going to be able to manage any of that? I'm going to try. It's nice to see that you're eating something with a bit more flavour than what you normally have. It's really nice. It's quite sweet. How's it going down? Is it spicy enough for you, or is it still quite bland? It's really tasteful. <laughs> it's called a Friday treat. <laughs> I think you should make it a treat more often. It seems Saskia and Nick are finally enjoying each other's meals. And before they go home, Dr Christian wants to hand over their healthy eating plans. In many respects, this was the easy bit, because now you've got to go home and do all this yourself. A lot of your help is here. Your diet plans. But Saskia, that one is yours. Nick, that one's yours. And I'm going to see you in a few weeks' time, see how you're getting on. Saskia will be on a diet plan of 2,000 calories a day, which will mean cutting down on the major sources of fat in her diet and including more complex carbohydrates, such as wholemeal bread, pasta and rice, as well as fruit and vegetables. All of this should help her feel fuller for longer. Nick's diet plan boosts his calorie intake from a measly 1,597 to 2,500, the amount needed for a healthy man, and includes starchy carbohydrates, as well as sources of healthy fats, such as nuts, seeds, vegetable oils and spreads. The main thing that I've learned from here is that I have to get out of my routine, I have to get out of having the same things and overanalyzing what I'm eating. I'm looking forward to get on with the food plan, really. The reason that I'm eating so much is probably because I'm bored and I'm used to it. And once I break the habit, then, you know, I can eat less than I do. And I think Nick's routine and diet has really taught me that. All right, it was really lovely meeting you. Good luck. Yep, yeah, Andrew, I hope you feel better next time I see you. Evansville, Indiana. America's fattest city. On the front line of the battle against obesity here in Evansville is the Deaconess Hospital, where, just like in the population, over a third of the patients here are obese. On a daily basis, the staff have to deal with the sharp end of the obesity crisis, from amputations due to type 2 diabetes to heart problems and educating the next generation to make sure they don't follow suit. But some patients feel it's too late and resort to more extreme measures to control their intake of food. Good. Suction out. Okay. The bariatric department offers two main types of surgery, the lap band and the gastric bypass. At the Deaconess, they perform three to five weight loss surgeries like this a week. And in the UK, figures are rising. From 7,214 in 2010, to 8,087 the following year, up 12%. Dr. David Kohler specializes in lap band adjustments. Well, the lap band has the inner inflatable part there. That is actually what inflates and tightens down around the top of the stomach. So effectively what you do is you get a narrowing that will hold the food up and allow you to get satisfied more early. Rachel had hers fitted four years ago and is back for a review. I just find my stomach maybe holds a little bit more and I'm hungry still. Sometimes after a year, just a small, minor adjustment will help out. OK. Fluid is injected into Rachel's lap band to further inflate it so that less food is allowed into her stomach. We're done. Since having hers fitted, Rachel has lost five stone six pounds. But a lap band is not a quick fix and it doesn't work for everybody. What surgery are you having? I'm having a gastric bypass. Why have you chosen the bypass? 
Um, it's the end all. I've done everything else. I've done the diets. I've done the lap band. So this surgery for you, this is kind of last chance saloon, really, isn't it? It is the last chance. James's current weight is 25 stone, 6 pounds. James had a, uh, a laparoscopic band placed about a year and a half ago, and he did not have much success with it. So we've uh, elected to remove the band and proceed with a gastric bypass. Unlike the lap band, which can be removed, a gastric bypass is non-reversible. The stomach is stapled to make it permanently smaller, which will mean that James will never be able to eat in the same way again. However, having the procedure does carry risks. The death rate is about one in 200 operations, and around 20% of patients regain much of their weight within a few years. For James, however, the procedure has been a success, and he's lost four stone, two pounds to date. It's made it very clear that the complications of being obese are very undesirable. The answer is just not putting the weight on in the first place. It's been eight weeks since supersizer Saskia and super skinny Nick left the feeding clinic. And now it's time to find out if they've been faithful to their diet plans. I'm a bit anxious about getting on the scales. I know I've put some weight on, but I just don't know if it's as much as I wanted to put on by now. Just kind of want to find out. How have the last few months been then? They've been okay. I've been trying to keep the diet as much as I can. Successfully, do you think? Yep, successfully. It's slowly getting better and better, like less routine, less thinking about what I'm eating. Which is what I wanted. I wanted you to sort of chill out a bit and not worry about it so much. Do you enjoy food? Turns out profiteroles are quite nice. <laughs> Good. They're a new, a new experience. A new experience for me. That was quite Excellent. nice. Yeah, I enjoy it a lot more now. Now I'm not continuously thinking about what I'm eating. You used not to eat foods together. You'd have to eat one thing at a time. Has that changed? No, I'm mixing everything now. It's kind of like eating out with a five-year-old because I'm trying all different things together, seeing what works and what doesn't. I found that cheese and grapes that taste quite good together. What sort of changes have you noticed to your body? I can definitely see that I've gained a bit of weight on my legs and across my chest. You can't see my ribs so much anymore. I know I've put something on, just don't know how much. And how about Saskia? Well, a sudden personal problem meant she couldn't come back to catch up with Nick, but we spoke to her instead. She has managed to lose half a stone and is going to carry on with the healthy eating. Well done, Saskia. And I wish her all the best for the future. In the meantime, Nick. And I just want to tell you, big, big happiness for you because you've done fantastically well. And I'm really, really pleased. Phenomenally, you've put on a stone in weight in just over a couple of months, which is amazing. How do you feel? Great, that's, that's what I wanted. More importantly than that, you've put on two inches around your chest. Nice. And two inches around each thigh. So I'm delighted, Nick. <laughs> well done, congratulations. Thank you. When Dr. Christian told me I put on a stone, I was so happy and relieved that I've done it. The extra inches that I've gained is, is quite good, because before I was just scrawny and thin, but not quite so much now. I've managed to put on a stone, I've met my target, so I'm going to leave a happy man.